So my side of the talk is probably what we're asked most commonly in our practices. You see a patient who's been in remission for three or four years, you can't tell that they even have IBD anymore, and they say, do I really need to take this medicine for the rest of my life? So Scott Lee, and I'm gonna debate both Scotts today, Scott Lee gave you the business as usual, not business sex, which I'm still interested in understanding that <laughs> term, um, but the business as usual approach where the mantra of we should continue forever. I would like to present the data in the next nine or 10 minutes in a different way and have you look at data you've seen a million times before, but consider it a bit differently to make my argument. So this is one approach, and this is a cartoon. If you can't read, the pharmacist is telling the patient, take one a day until either the prescription runs out or they release a new study, whichever comes first. Um, this is Scott's approach. Um, I think this is a picture from a few years ago, but it looks like he's still in high school. Um, and, and the idea of just keep taking the medicine and tell something else. And we probably all tell our patients that, but in the back of my mind, I sometimes want wonder is that right way. So prior to considering can we stop treatment, let's just pause for a minute and Scott already set the stage to some of the placebo rates in our studies and is it possible that we are over treating a group of our patients? So in essence, patients who are brought into remission and do not go on active treatment essentially are in placebo, what are those rates? How do those look long term? So focus on placebo rates. When you look at the Markowitz study on 6-MP, prednisone induction and then 6-MP, then placebo, look at that. 50% of patients who are not on active treatment over the period of the course of study are still in remission. Brian Fagan, methotrexate, not dissimilar. Patients brought into remission on prednisone and then randomized to placebo or methotrexate, the placebo rates are nearly 40%. What about anti-TNF? Scott already mentioned this. You give a patient an anti-TNF treatment, what are the percentage of patients if you do nothing? Look at the placebo rates. It's about 20% of patients do well long-term without drug. So this is infliximab, adalibumab. So again, we're not used to looking at placebo rates in the sense of withdrawing treatment. Induction adalibumab followed by placebo. Yes, the active drug treatment rates are higher, but when you consider the placebo rate after induction, it's 44%. And then finally, seratolizumab. So all three anti-TNFs, placebo rate in this group was about 29, 30%. So you could argue that 20 to 50% of patients who you bring into remission on your induction treatment and then withdraw therapy, 20 to 50% of patients are able to maintain remission at the end of all of these studies without medication. Is it possible, and just to pause and think about it, is it possible that we're over-treating a subset of our patients? And I think Scott identified this, and in fairness, I think at the end we're gonna probably agree more than disagree, but the question is, can we correctly identify the patient who doesn't need long-term treatment? So we could end the debate here. We could agree that Pittsburgh's a better city than Seattle for sports <laughs> and for a lot of other reasons, but that's not the question. The debate's about stopping treatment, specifically biologic, uh, and, and I think I agree with Scott. Let's not talk about the obvious side effects. That's why we have to stop. Let's talk about the patient you see in your practice who says, I don't want to take this anymore. I felt great for three years, and you're telling me I have complete mucosal healing. If the target to treat is valid, do we really need to continue the medicines? So there are three possible scenarios that I'd like to present, and I'll only present one of the data. So one is patients on combination treatment who stop azathioprine 6-MP and continue their anti-TNF. The, the part that I'm gonna focus on most is stopping anti-TNF. So the debate is primarily over, can we stop the anti-TNF? And Scott mentioned from the studies, many of these patients are on combination. Can we stop the anti-TNF? And, and at present, we don't have enough data to say withdraw all treatment. However, I'll give you my opinion on possibly, possibly a subgroup of patients that we could consider. All of the stop studies for anti-TNF so far have been in natalibumab and infliximab, and all of the data, at least that I'm aware of, have been in Crohn's. We don't yet have data in ulcerative colitis. So what are the data on stopping anti-TNF in patients on combination? And there are three studies, uh, the WA study, Louis study, and then more recently, the Malnar study. So what about stopping patients, and this is the first study in 2010, 
patients in maintenance, and this, is, uh, this wasn't a randomized uh, controlled study. There were 48 patients who were in remission on infliximab, uh, and they were on concomitant immunomodulators in two-thirds of the patients. And about a third, they were not on any concomitant treatment. And essentially what they did is they looked at withdrawing the azathioprine, sorry, withdrawing the infliximab and seeing what happens long term. Well, look at what happens at one year in patients who stop. 50% relapsed, but look at it differently. So forget the business as usual, the sky is falling if you stop treatment. 50% of the patients were still in remission. So the, the flip side is some of these patients do well. I will also submit to all of you, when you go to DDW in every conference, the Kaplan-Meier curves unfortunately all look about the same. We see initial great response, and then over time, we see about 50% loss of response in all of our medicines. Ideally, we'd like to see a plateau from the start. Uh, later, I'll argue the surgical followed by treatment, and there may be ways we can achieve higher remission long term. But all the studies look about the same. Well, what about withdrawing infliximab? And this is looking at the STORY study. And this is probably the best prospective data that we have to this point. Uh, this was Louis that published this in Gastro in 2011. You're probably familiar with these data, but they took 115 patients who were in remission on infliximab and azathioprine. So a typical scenario that you see in your practices every day. And they had been in remission for a period of time off of steroids, uh, and the patients were then stopped in their infliximab. Again, Kaplan-Meier curve looks very sim similar. 50% of the patients relapse, but 50% of the patients did not relapse off of treatment. So I guess it depends on how you look at it. 50% didn't relapse, 50% did. But one important aspect, and Scott mentioned this in the fear of episodic and restarting treatment. Look at what they did. In the patients who relapsed, they restarted infliximab, and 88% of the patients were able to respond again to infliximab. So they saw a high rescue rate in patients who started infliximab again. And then the final study that looked at anti-TNF withdrawal is the more recent one, and you may not be familiar with these data. And I have to say the acronym of the study is probably the worst acronym I've ever heard for any study because it's called the RASH study. Uh, this was done in Hungary. Uh, there were 121 patients who stopped anti-TNF. They had a combination of infliximab and adalibumab. 85% were on concomitant therapy. That means 15% were on monotherapy. Uh, and again, the primary endpoints they looked at were time to relapse and factors associated with relapse. Now, the, the pictures are small, and I don't expect you to read each one. And even on your small tablet, I, I bet you probably can't make out the words. But the bottom line is, it looks about the same. Nearly 50% of patients continue to do well off of treatment, 50% Relapse. Now, they did look at certain factors, smoking, steroid treatment, previous biologics, so meaning they had been on a biologic and this was their second biologic. They required dose intensification. They lost response and required a higher dose, a shorter interval of infliximab, similar with adalibumab, and CRP elevation. And they found that all of those corresponded with higher rates of relapse if you were to stop the infliximab. So the conclusions for their study were 55% of the patients did not relapse off of treatment, 45% did, and previous anti-TNFs and dose intensification were probably the two factors that predicted who relapsed off of treatment the most. They also found, despite what Scott just told you a minute ago, that 55% of their patients were able to re-respond to starting infliximab. So all three studies, and I guess Scott's a uh, half-empty guy and I'm a half-full guy, all three studies show about the same thing. 50% of the patients do well. And the question is picking the right patient. And I'd like to end with some of the potential predictors of who may be, may be the right patient that we can stop treatment. Obviously, if they have signs of active disease, that is not the right patient we should have this discussion on. Smokers, interestingly, probably carry a risk in Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis, Uma alluded to the opposite effect. 
prior biologics. So this isn't their first, this is their second, their third biologic. And those that require dose intensification, so the more challenging patients to get under control. And obviously steroids probably play a role as well. So who may be the right patient to consider? That patient in deep remission who's been in deep remission. Mucosal healing is going to be a topic, I think, of the next debate, but has been doing well for a long period of time. So forget the stop anti-TNF question, and then I'm just going to uh, end with a couple of tables to summarize this. What happens in your patients that continue treatment? So Scott said never stop. Never is a long time. Never stop treatment in your patients on an anti-TNF. What do the data look like in continuing treatment? Well, it looks about the same. So these are six studies, four of which are with infliximab, two with adalibumab, look out to five years and look at the relapse rate in patients who don't stop treatment. And if I showed you the Kaplan-Meier curves from every single one of these studies, they look exactly the same. About 50% over time lose response. So if you put all of the data together, and these are in your syllabus, and this is just a summary to look at what happens stopping immunomodulators. I didn't cover that topic, but that looks about the same. The anti-TNF stop studies are eerily similar. 50% remain in remission off of anti-TNF treatment. Continuing all treatment, not stopping anything, a la Scott Lee, again, it's about 50% that relapse with continued treatment. So when you put the data all together, whether you stop treatment or continue, I think is the issue. We don't yet have data on withdrawing all, completely all treatment uh, uh, at this point. So these data that I presented, most of them had been on azathioprine 6-MP. This wasn't stopping everything. However, this is the, an area of interest. And I think at DDW and in the future years, we're going to look at biologic reset and potentially, potentially identify patients who may do well over time. So I think the question is, are we potentially over-treating a subset of patients just by saying, take this drug for the rest of your life? I think we maybe are. I think the, the issue is, how do you look at this and identifying the predictors? So my concluding slide is that stopping anti-TNF, again, it's about a 50-50% proposition. And when patients come in and ask me, I don't want to take this treatment anymore, they're in deep remission, I tell them it's about a 50% chance that you're probably going to relapse. Two studies showed that we can restart treatment. And I think there are ways to do that, which I'm not going to go into uh, at this point. So again, despite what Scott tells you, yes, I think that there probably are a subset of patients that we can stop treatment. Thank you very much. Okay.